We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I'm the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Robert Johnson. He is a corporate attorney and chief diversity officer at Gibbons PC. Robert, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself uh, for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly it answered the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, well thank you for having me, and it's a, a pleasure to uh, to. to to uh, meet you um you know I'm, I'm you know i'm originally from waco texas um i uh went to rice university in houston on a, a a basketball scholarship uh played a few years professionally in france and then went to law school um went to law school at seat hall and that's how i got to the northeast um and i've kind of been at gibbons as as a corporate attorney most of my professional career I took two years off. I was in the governor's council for the governor of the state of New Jersey from 2010 and 2012, then came back to the firm and um, came partner in 2017. And uh, in addition to becoming partner in the corporate group, I'm a corporate M&A attorney, but I, I took on a role of chief diversity officer. Um, in terms of what did I want to be when I grew up, <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, it's just probably a weird answer. I wanted to be an NBA basketball player. <laughs> which is um, I'm doing something completely polar opposite from what that was um, during that time. But that was kind of a goal of mine. And, you know, you know, basketball you know, opened a lot of doors for me. I went to really good undergrad school at Rice. Um, I got to live in, uh, you know, different countries and travel a lot and, and travel to different states um, through basketball. And, um, you know, once I got that out of my system, I uh, uh, decided to go to law school. So I guess, was helpful in terms of discipline and kind of getting through law school. And so some of the same discipline and skills are required as an attorney, um, just in terms of time management. So, um, but yeah, and, um, I wanted to be something drastically different um, <laughs> than what I'm doing now, but uh, life is funny that way. Life is funny that way. Definitely not a, a weird answer. I, I love it. It sounds like you have a lot of experiences as well. And, you know, fast forwarding to today, your personal why, or I would love to know kind of how you uh, see your journey really leading to where you are today in your career in law um, and really working on uh, diversity and inclusion uh, at Gibbons uh, as well. Yeah, you know, my, my personal journey is, you know, I'm like I said, I'm from Waco, Texas, um, you know, um, from the South. My, my grandmother, um, you know, she recently passed. But, you know, uh, in terms of dealing, being aware of some of the struggles that she had to deal with growing up. I mean, you know, she was born in 31. She went to college in like 19, I want to say 54. I might have these years wrong, but graduated from Houston Tillerson and um, very intelligent woman, you know, obviously growing up doing Jim Crow South, uh, a lot of kind of tough things to deal with. You know, I think in, in context, um, University of Texas, Austin, I think two years later, um, the first two African-Americans matriculated. And I think I want to say 54 or 56 and just put it in the time in terms of context of kind of some of the discrimination during that uh, 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 you know obvious discrimination during that time um you know so i was just well aware of that um like you know kind of how she kind of used education as a way to kind of better her situation and from my grandfather and and you know we, we went to the army and, and and just some of the kind of like life tools that i've learned from them just were based on their experiences it kind of helped me navigate through you know certain situations where I am personally been discriminated against. Um, it was kind of kind of in a weird way comforting to know that I hadn't had to deal with some of the things that they had to deal with. So, um, you know, as I, you know, went to law school, I think I learned about a lot of this discrimination in terms of like laws and policy. You learn a lot about this stuff in constitutional law, criminal procedure. Um, you know, I think that opened my eyes to a lot of the stuff that I had experienced just growing up. You know, um, 
and you know that that you know I, I took a strong interest in it and I turned end up being a corporate attorney um you know which which had to learn how to you know become a good corporate attorney m a is my specialty but as I took on the role of chief diversity officer um it you know from my life personal experiences you know it, you know making getting to some form of equity was just very important to me at my core because I feel like we miss out on a lot of good people when things aren't equal and other people don't have opportunity as a society as a whole we miss out on these people so um you know I, it kind of went into some of the like programs and the external partnerships I've had our law firm uh, enter into with like the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership and the African American Chamber of Commerce you know providing what we provide really well at this law firm, good legal services um, on a pro bono basis to like some of these, you know, women of color founded businesses who are looking for seed or early stage investment financing. That's kind of in my wheelhouse of practice area. I do a lot of work with startups, um, you know, making sure we partner with some of these groups, at least take one cost away from them because, you know, um, in terms of, you know, investment, these businesses are woefully underfunded and have, many much less opportunity i think in 2021 it was 330 billion dollars of, of vc dollars spent and 0.34 percent of that went to women of color founded businesses so um being a corporate attorney and working with companies like this i know this i didn't know that numbers were that bad but um it led me to kind of forming some of the you know partnerships or, or pushing our firm to, to partner with some of these organizations to kind of you know from a social equity um, and in and, and a business case, um, kind of help help kind of undo some of the past wrongs that are systemic in society today. So but that's kind of, you know, based out of Waco and my, my grandparents experiences, my, my mother and father experiences, um, some of the things that they had to deal with and, and things have progressively gotten better over time. Um, just not forgetting about that and um, trying to um, pay it forward whenever I can. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that and the foundations for uh, your wife for getting into this work. And I'm sorry to hear about the passing of your grandmother as well. And to your point as well, partnerships in the community are really important, looking for ways to really actively and, and proactively create equity internally and externally uh, is really critical to this work. Uh, in terms of from an industry perspective, what is your kind of state of equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, in the law right now from your perspective? Um, in terms of like our role in, in terms of setting a standard for diversity in the legal industry, like yes. from the firm perspective or? Yeah, so from the firm perspective and uh, from your experience in law. Well, I mean, you know, when we speak about Diversity, and equity, inclusion. It, it can, from a law, I'm coming from a law firm perspective. You know, it could be internally work allocation programs, and you know, having. I'm part. I kind of head a, a, a diversity committee in, in the firm, so we kind of talk about associate or lawyers' experience within the firm, um, which I think a lot of focus is always on that, like how you how, how you're treated at work, how you feel, the opportunities that you get. But um, I like to also focus on, and I mentioned, and I briefly alluded to some of these, um, you know, partnerships that we made, you know, with, with outside organizations. There are external components that you can kind of do and external organizations that kind of do this full time. Because in, in short, we are a law firm, um, you know, and, and our goal is to provide legal services, but we, you know, providing some of the resources that we have, you know, mostly to you know, large corporate clients that can pay, but we can also provide these resources to smaller, diverse bi businesses that have been, you know, historically discriminated. That's a way you can kind of push for diversity, can, not just in, internally at your law firm, but in the broader community as well. Um, and we've we've kind of gone in, 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 you know, what a law firm sells is like at the, you know, the billable hours, our time, right? Um, and we've donated hundreds and hundreds of hours on, a, on an annual basis to uh, the Small Business Needs Us, um, which is an initiative set up by the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership, was based out of based out of here in Newark, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and they are you know, similar to like an incubator for women of color founded businesses. 
um, help connecting them or preparing them to get it seed and in, seed investments and venture capital investments um, as being part of like, you know, the partnerships where, you know, we provide pro bono legal services for the companies that are cohorts in that initiative. Um, you know, we structured uh, an equitable small business initiative, which is a joint venture um, between um, two of our longtime clients, you know, between the, with African chair the African-American Chamber of Commerce in New Jersey um, and the New Jersey Community Capital, which is a large CDFI fund, who's been like a client of the firm for years, but kind of setting up, um, you know, kind of a lending arm to minority-owned businesses in the state of New Jersey who are having issues getting traditional bank capital, um, you know, creating that partnership, you know, um, between that to kind of help businesses. Because if you help businesses, minority-owned businesses in those communities, that creates kind of a multiplier effect. And um, you can help a lot more people on an individual basis. You know, we we do a clerkship program we call the CAP program, where we kind of target it to first generational and minority law, law students um, to kind of help them secure clerkships after their second year of law school. Um, you know, from a hiring perspective, we don't hire directly at a law school. We require, at least at the, in the in the litigation, which is the largest part of the firm, we require you to complete a clerkship. Well, you know, with, with, the, with all the local law schools and, and law schools even outside of the state, we kind of do this clerkship program where we have attorneys and attorneys on like on our hiring committee conduct real interviews, kind of letting students know what they need to know in order to secure a clerkship, making calls on their behalf to get them clerkships. Um, and then after that, after you secure the clerkship, they're in a position to be hired by a firm. And we've hired people from this. And these are first generational minority law students, um, you know, getting valuable advice from attorneys from all across the practice areas, from, from corporate M&A to criminal, to, you know, commercial litigation to, to, to intellectual property, getting valuable information that they just don't know. So setting up programs like that is our, you know, those are really good external programs that we can use the resources of a large regional Northeastern law firm to kind of help push diversity um, in a broader community. So um, those are some of the things that we do and they've caught on. A lot of firms are doing the same thing that we're doing, quite frankly, um, you know, and, and and that's a good thing. We didn't set out um, to do it, but it's just kind of examples and other firms take notice and these organizations are happy that we provide these services and they publicize it and, and other firms, you know, uh, say, hey, we can do this too. So um, a lot of pro bono initiatives like that with those organizations, IFO and African American Chamber of Commerce and, and the CAP program, um, you, know, you know, those are some of the things that we kind of do to kind of help push diversity forward in, in, our, in our local community. Yeah, emphasizing uh, those resources, the time, the opportunity to create change externally is really important to highlight as well and setting an example for other folks in the industry. So there is that multiplier effect is is great too. I do want to touch on the internal piece as well in terms of company culture with all of the changes happening in the workforce. We know that positive company culture is being more sought after than ever before. Uh, from your perspective, do you think the easiest way to improve company culture is to really identify and remove uh, those workplace issues? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I you know, we're, I think we're in a unique time in American history, right? And I think since George Floyd, a lot of these initiatives have been, have been around, these diversity initiatives, they've been around for a long time, right? Um, I think they were really highlighted because of a combination of things from COVID and everyone being home, everyone being forced to watch the George Floyd, you know, murder <laughs> um, by police on television. You know what I mean? I, to, to pay attention, you know, the, the, you know, you couldn't take your attention away from it. You couldn't turn on to like the the March Madness basketball tournament, like a lot of the sporting events, and, and all the things that distract you from some of the real kind of you know, cultural issues that we're having, not just in, in law or business or just in, in, in society as a whole, I think people were forced to look at it. So that kind of brought a lot of attention. And I think after 2020, you saw a lot of companies, not just law firms, trying to find ways to improve diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, in terms of the company culture, you know, I, you know, I think we're in a point where, you know, it's, a, you know, 
things have always been the way they've been for a long time. I think people in in, in our role, A, you need to educate, right? Um, a lot of this has changed for people who might be in the majority and aren't accustomed to, you know, using pronouns, aren't accustomed to a lot of different things, right? And it may seem like it's moving fast to them, but people who, if you're in the minority, you know, it's not moving fast enough. But, you know, I, I think, you know, education about implicit biases and things like that, that anytime a company can kind of do the type of implicit bias training that helps you improve company culture because a lot of some of these issues, right? Um, people aren't even aware that they have some of these blind spots. You know, they not, might not be aware that they're being offensive. Um, it's, it's obviously the, the people who are intentionally a certain way. And you, you know, if you're intentionally being offensive, you obviously, from a company perspective, you're a malcontent and you may need to be removed if you can't after education you continue to display that certain type of behavior. Um, but I think, um, you know, the easy way to, easiest way to improve company culture is like, you know, implementing some type of diversity training, implicit bias training, because we all have blind spots. We are all are products of, um, you know, our environment and our programming is where we grew up. And if you, if, if some of those, that programming is, is not receptive to diversity and equity inclusion, you may need to intentionally unprogram that way. And you may not even be aware of a lot of these biases. Um, but if, if you have the opportunity to participate in training, and, and quite frankly, it's not just, you know, if you're white that you, you need to train. We all have these biases, right? And training, and I've participated in a lot of this training, helped me be aware that I have some of these blind spots and, you know, A, be a better human being and, and B, be a better employee, which right. naturally improves the company culture. So, um, you know, I think education helps you identify. And after education, if people are recalcitrant and want to continue to be a certain way that's kind of negative and not open to diversity and equity and inclusion, because that's the way of the future, because the new workforce is demanding it. And if you have individuals who refuse after being kind of exp being exposed or explained to them, um, then you might have to talk about removal. Um, but I think education is key uh, in teaching and the easiest way to improve company culture. And these are programs that uh, any, not just a law firm, a business or anyone can kind of easily kind of take or implement for the employees. Absolutely. I like what you said about kind of unprogramming biases and really unlearning some of these things, providing those, again, resources and, and education opportunities. And then that next step is taking that forward and how do you implement, you know, what you're learning in your day to day as a leader, as a team member as well. Uh, we know a lot of folks, as you were talking about, can't kind of uh, silo their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts and really need to focus on where they want to make change. What would you say is the North Star? I would say our goal, and in, in, this is my opinion, but I think it's, it's grounded in reality and, and, and data of what firms are trying to do. I, I think the goal of any type of DE&I effort or program, and I know this is the case at Gibbons, is to... Yeah. And at other law firms, it should be able to attract, recruit, and retain and promote a diverse attorney workforce. That's kind of the the pillar of kind of the underpinning of any type of strategy or or, or anything we do here at the firm in, in terms of the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because you got to be able to attract people, and you got to be able to recruit. And once we get them in the door, divert, when I say them, meaning diverse attorneys, you got to be able to retain them. We got to make sure that they're successful. And you know, so they mean a situation to be promoted. They'd be promoted to a partner. Then they're trying to change the culture of the place because they become owners of the firm. Right. And and if you have more diverse partners who who hopefully have the experiences um, of kind of navigating the world as a diverse person, um, that'll naturally change the kind of culture of the place because a corporation, a law firm, wherever, they're just, they're just comprised of people. And if you have more, if you're in a, in a situation where you can attract and recruit and retain and, and promote diverse people, that's going to do wonders for any type of strategy that you do. Um, it's going to make 
you know, the people who comprise your law firm or your company more receptive to doing partnerships where you give hundreds and hundreds of hours that, you know, translate to millions of dollars, by the way, yeah. billable time. You know, we, we say these are, but like, that's time that we're not working on a billable matter. So, it, and we give you, we give you billable credit for that time, you know, yeah. for your turn. So, that, you know, it's not just like, oh, you do this. This is, you know, you get the right towards your billable hour, of your, your yearly requirements. If you're working on a diversity matter, you get billable time forces for the hours you work to incentivize people who might not naturally think diversity and equity inclusion is is important, but it incentivizes them to do good work. And that yeah. kind of gets into the, what your company does. So it, ha it can't just be corporate social responsibility. It has to be kind of an, an economic reason grounded in it. But, but as in terms of everything, you know, um, attract, recruit, retrain, and promote a diverse attorney workforce. And everything flows from that. Absolutely. And each step is really important in terms of attracting talent, retaining, promoting, really investing in uh, resources to ensure uh, leadership and uh, just new skills learned as well. Um, I would want to know at the time of this recording, we are in January of 2023, new year. Uh, what is a key learning of last year of 2022 uh, for you? And how has this influenced how you're looking at you know, this year's strategy? You know, I think, you know, 2022, we did a lot of things. We, we're continuing our partnerships with the African-American Chamber of Commerce and the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership, trying to get, we're trying to get more people or more of the companies to kind of be aware that like, hey, you know, these is pro bono legal services from, from one of the largest law firms in the state that are available to you. Um, you know, so continue those partnerships. Um, we're, we're, you know, I think some of that in success we've had with some of these partnerships is, you know, we're getting Mansfield certified this year. Um, that's kind of like a, a law firm certification. I don't know if it, it was based off the Rooney rule that the NFL uses to kind of increase diversity for like the head coaching and general manager positions in the NFL. Um, but yeah, all the players are majority black, but none of the none of the coaches are or in in management or are, are, are African American. So requiring them to at least interview one person of color or diverse person before they make a hire. And the Mansfield rule is kind of based off that, but it's it's in the context of law firm in terms of like promoting women and diverse partners. And you get a certification if you can reach all this criteria. Um, so the firm, it's for 2023, we're in course to get kind of Mansfield certified. That's something that's influenced the strategy. And that was based on 2022 of um, kind of how everyone was receptive in terms of what we were doing with like our other pro bono, uh, not pro bono, but our other partnerships with other diverse uh, diversity focused organizations like the Chamber and Eiffel um, has led the firm to kind of like take to heart in, in, in change this promotion in terms of women and diverse attorneys. And, and we've, we're at the point where we can get certified by Mansfield. So that's, that's influenced the strategy for 2023. So. Yeah. I think that is a really good example of looking ahead, kind of what you're working on and, and where you want to be as well and signaling to other folks that this is something that you really uh, believe in and the firm is committed to. Uh, Robert, I asked a lot of specific questions around your journey to this work and all of the things that you're doing at uh, Gibbons PC as well. Is there anything that I didn't specifically ask that you want to share uh, with folks listening or underscoring any key takeaways you hope people really bring with them? Um, you know, I, you know, I, we kind of alluded to this earlier when we were talking about where it's just a, a from a society societal perspective, we're at a, a unique time in history, right? You know, have demographics changing. Um, you have, you know, a, a younger workforce demanding diversity, equity, not just talking about it, but demanding it, demanding the place of employment to be receptive to these ideas, right? So um, for, for the existing or the kind of older you know, people in society, it might seem like a who are non-diverse. This might seem like a bit much, and, it's, and, and all of a sudden they have, in their mind, might have it's a steep learning curve. Um, but if you're a minority, you're like, what do you mean it's not a steep learning curve? This is reality, and this should be changed, and things should be more equitable. Um, you know, I I just think 
is get we're at all point we should we should remember the word patience um because you know i i get frustrated because things aren't moving as fast as they should be especially in the legal profession which is one of the least diverse professions in like the united states by the way at least from a law firm perspective the numbers are terrible um so you know I have to remind myself and, and, and people, you know, you know, you know, patience and, you know, and sometimes people are going to make mistakes along this journey towards making things equitable. We shouldn't necessarily destroy them, but we should try to help educate them because we want people who are in a majority to become allies for diversity, equity, inclusion, because that's important because we're going to need them if we're going to make any sustainable pushes. So, um, you know, I just would throw that nugget out there. Uh, for the people who work in this space, um, you know, we still got a long ways to go, um, you know, but, um, you know, just to remember patience as well um, and not to overly penalize people when they're kind of caught in mistakes. So remember patience, give yourself and others grace. I love that as a key nugget to, to think about as we top off our conversation. Robert, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. I really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, absolutely. Me too. Thank you. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in helping companies uncover and resolve workplace issues by giving employees a really a safe space to speak up. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone.